Because for each time, a robust understanding of the human person, and that includes intellect, will, free choice, we'll talk about that in a second, emotions and grace, understanding this in a very robust way is the hallmark of the feminine genius. That we are, as women, are actually made to get people. And that quality of personalism should permeate our work. And I think that's sometimes why so many of us feel our lack and our weakness so strongly, you know, this lack of charity or that moment of judgment, or, because we know it's, it's, our weakness is going against our greatest gift. So it's like, ouch. You know, so one of our sisters is directing the Scola, Sister Mara Grace, and you all don't know this, but I'm not musically talented, so just take me at my word for that. I know I'm Dominican Sister of St. Cecilia, but I'm not. So I was thinking, I don't feel a pinch when I realize she can direct and I can't. That's not part of my essence, right? It's not one of my gifts. I feel the pinch, which I think is a gift from God, when I lack charity, when I lack charity. So with Edith Stein, let's take a few minutes to try to get the human person. Because if we're going to educate, we need to understand the matter with which we're dealing. And Edith Stein was big on that. You better know what it is you're trying to form. Know where you're aiming them towards, or you're going to miss the mark. And that's what happened to Sir Thomas. So the human person has an intellect, despite all evidence to the contrary. And we're able to grasp universal principles, and then we apply those to practical judgments. And we can reflect upon those judgments, as in the case of conscience. And this is a spark of the divine in us. Aristotle knew that. And for this reason, one of the greatest social justice issues in 2016 is the formation of intellects, education. The human person is capable of guiding their way through natural law, and then with the help of grace, to heaven. So one of the greatest social justice issues is formation, education, and intellectual formation. However, it is not simply enough to know what is right. We all know. We, there are things we know, but we don't choose them. So what about that will? What is the will? Well, the will is an appetite, we say, meaning it has desire. It wants a type of craving, actually. It's a spiritual power. And it desires not just simply to make choices, that's what we tend to think, it actually wants to unite with the perceived good and to rest in it, and then we forget this one, to delight in it, to delight in it. So heaven isn't meant to be set up as this boring place where we strum the harp with the naked cherubim, right? And we're just like, we're here. It's supposed to be a delight in the rest of the final and eternal and divine good. As a side note, there are such things as false goods. We all know that. And false goods can give a false rest. Um, there's also lesser goods, and they're not bad in themselves, right? So Chipotle is a, is a good. It's a lesser good. If you went to the ones that make you sick, that might be a false good. I don't know. Um, we can talk about that at dinner. So false goods give false rests. And rest, modern man is restless. We're pretty restless, right? That's why whatever agenda we have, whatever view we have, we need everyone to be on board with it. We need a parade for it. We need a Facebook page for it. We need everyone on board. We're restless. We're not at peace. However, God can use everything, and he will use that restless heart that St. Augustine talks about, and the restless will, so the will that's not resting, not delighting, but has settled for a lesser or a false good, can actually push on that intellect not physically, right, but can push on that intellect for more information. So the person who's not totally satisfied, so for example, if someone's gossiping, take an easy example, the will can request more information from the intellect. I'm not okay with that judgment I made. I want more. So the will doesn't just obey whatever the intellect says to do. And actually, Pope Francis says in Amoris Laetitiae that these good choices are the building blocks of our moral life. And he says it shapes our freedom so that we do not become slaves of dehumanizing and antisocial inclinations. Now, the will isn't exactly free. So, sorry about that. That's a longer topic. Um, the will is actually already inclined to the good. That's, that's its nature. But we have a thing called free choice, and that often is called free will. But free choice isn't, um, it isn't a function, it's a flourishing of the intellect and the will working together. It's like, why am I telling you all this stuff? Why? Because if we don't know what we're forming, we won't know how to form them. And I think most of us, we struggle somewhere on that intellect, that will, and we'll get to the emotions level. So the capacity to imitate God, to grow in his likeness, is actually referring to our function of 
free choice, for lack of a better word, our ability to use the intellect and the will in a type of harmony that allows us to move ourselves, whereas the rest of creation is moved. We, we go out in love. So freedom isn't about the choice between opposites. Because if it were, then our blessed mother is not free because she's not up there deliberating and stressing out between good and evil. So it's not about choice. It's about delighting in the good. The blessed mother rests in the good. And that just sounds wonderful. That sounds delightful, right? And there's a theologian, Father Giertek, says that this mature exercise of the function of free choice of true good is a sign of the sanctifying and divine presence. It's the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, allowing us to see, to know, to choose, and to delight in what is truly good. Okay, then we have the emotions. And I, every time I have a chance to talk on the emotions, I just like to say, as a room full of women, don't we love this idea that our emotions someday will be perfectly in line with reality? I mean, that's just, let's just contemplate that one, okay? All right, the emotions are good. Do not believe that we're too emotional as a culture. I think we're really uncomfortable with emotion as a culture, actually. We're like, ooh, your opinion makes me feel bad. Stop talking. Like, well, are you okay feeling bad? You know, like, you don't have to agree with everyone. It's okay, just keep dialoguing. So we're not too emotional. The, ener the energy they give us um, helps us to act, right? Um, but Edith Stein does say that education must awaken joyful emotion for authentic beauty and goodness and disgust for that which is base and vulgar. So we need a training, a formation in our emotions so that they are in accord with reality. All right, so what are the challenges that we might face as educators? Because if education is about the formation of the human person, I need to look here. Where is my formation? Where was Sir Thomas's formation? What made Edith Stein so excellent? What was her feminine genius? She made it her art and her craft to get us. And I would have a hunch, based on the way she interacts with many of us, that she would leave us very free to our gifts and even our struggles, but that she would guide us through that some common weaknesses to look out for. One, we might mis misunderstand the free will, okay? So we might think that their will is only free if they know truth, therefore we've gotta kinda of push that truth on them. And we might set up a system somewhat akin to Sir Thomas's household where there's a type of control and facade of virtue where in my presence, my students act correctly because it's what I demand. And then I never get to know them and I never get to know what church teachings seem to hurt their heart because it hurts someone they think that they love. I never get to know them. Or this misunderstanding of free will, maybe just not wanting to know what the other is struggling with, can lead to a willed ignorance. And Pope Francis in Amoris Laetitia says, where is their soul, meaning the children? Where is their soul? Do we know? And then he says, Above all, do we want to know? Do I want to know what their struggles are? Do I want to know what their worldview is? Do I want to enter into that? Or is it safer over here? So Edith Stein would look at this and say, this is a personalism gone wrong. I'm not wanting to enter into, I'm actually kind of wanting to control them. So while she is the biggest proponent, I think, of the feminine genius and the gifts that women bring to this world, and John Paul used her writings, she's also very clear that we need to have self-knowledge. We need to know our hearts, not to beat ourselves up. Because here's the thing. Um, if I know my weaknesses, by his wounds we were healed. If I know my weaknesses, I can name them, and they'll probably be fonts of compassion. Because otherwise, I can be pretty judgmental. and Get over it, whatever. I've never felt that. So if we know our weaknesses, we can have compassion. 